we are going to get into the epistle to uh, the Colossians uh, today and start out with marking um, some of the similarities between uh, the letter to the believers in Colossae uh, with uh, a few other letters that Paul wrote, Colossians, uh, like Philippians and Ephesians, and I think even First and Second Thessalonians, were more likely than not written while Paul was uh, under or in confinement in Rome in the first the first time that he was. Um, I guess we could call it imprisoned. It was more like a house arrest. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, for a moment, let's take on the mind of Paul. Uh, we know that he had the freedom while he was under house arrest to have visitors. And we know that Paul continued uh, much of his spiritual teaching and admonishment with those who were able to come to him. Some of those were other apostles like Timothy and some of the other uh, leaders that came um, to visit him, uh, to bring news to him. Uh, he was also able to receive certain messengers uh, that brought um, helps. We know that that was the case uh, with the uh, church in Philippi. <clears throat> that they were able to send some some needed uh, necessities for Paul. Interestingly, you know, even while he was under house arrest, it's likely that he had still had to pay for the place that he was staying. He was still under those kinds of obligations, but not necessarily free to go out and work and do things like that. So it was important for him to have, at that time and during that time, the support of other believers. Um, Paul's perspective on that is very interesting. You know, Paul... We don't see Paul asking for anything of anyone. We know that when Paul traveled during his uh, journeys where the Lord sent him, uh, what has been called his missionary journeys, we know that he worked while he did that. And we can see that in his letters that when he stayed in certain areas and cities, he uh, earned his own wages and paid his own way. So he made it very clear that he was not there to try and take anything from the people. However, nonetheless, uh, Paul was also, as an apostle, um, <clears throat> very keen to lay the foundations of this kingdom life and this way of life that, that was to mark the people of God. And as we noticed in Ephesians, this touch, touches every aspect of life. Um, with Ephesians in particular, you know, we saw a, a really broad layout of the plan of God. We saw that God's plan is, it's governmental. It has a particular administration and it has a law. It's judicial. So there's an order to it. And it is through that order of life and by that order of life, that way of life, which in practice will produce a culture that will ultimately not only set people, God's people apart from the rest of the people of the world as a peculiar people, but it will also be used by God to display his wisdom, not only to all mankind, but to all creation, um, both in the heavens and on the earth. And so, you know, Paul having this revelation of God's plan, when he traveled and we're going to touch on this as we go through a Colossians, but I, one thing that I want us to be very clear about, and the reason that I am have been hesitant to use the word missionary journey, uh, uh, you know, mission trip, as they as some have described Paul's travels early on, was that we, you know, I, from my own experience, maybe not for you younger folks as much because you haven't had. Uh, you were not raised per se uh, under evangelical teachings and with a particular um, idea in relation to the gospel, what the gospel is, what that message is, what it entails, what it produces. How, um, but nonetheless, there remains 
today in Protestant and evangelical circles in particular, the idea that a missionary or a missions trip is all about sharing um, the gospel of salvation. So what we've discussed this before, but very shortly, that it primarily entails the message of being forgiven from sin so that you can be saved from hell and spend eternity in heaven. That's the gist of it. And the rest of it is try to live the best life, the most pious, noble life that you can until you get to go to heaven. But some of the ideas that are carried with that same message uh, come with uh, the it, – it, it's very subtle. It's an undertone, but really it, it sets the, uh, a, a precedence for the undermining – or the degradation of the Mosaic law. So the idea being that when Christ came, everything that was given to Moses by God no longer had any need or application because we have all this freedom in Christ. When in reality, that's not the life that Jesus lived. It's not the message he preached. It's not the message that he gave to the disciples to spread. Rather, he was speaking a fulfillment of the law. So the fulfillment of the law is not about the law having no impact anymore or no efficacy or no uh, importance or relevance. It was that it can now be fulfilled through this way of life, through this pattern of life. So the differentiation is that no, it, it's not possible to fulfill the legal requirements of the law on your own through this particular way or practice of life. Jesus himself said, unless your righteousness exceeds, goes beyond, is greater than that of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were those who, who to the greatest extent possible, followed every minute, meticulous detail of the law to such an extent that they got lost in it. But they were lost in it, believing they were saved by it. And Jesus came and unraveled all that in front of them and said, you think you're saved by this, but what the law was supposed to produce. In other words, what Jesus was saying was the fulfillment of the law was supposed to produce something in God's people and for God's people. And he said, you've missed that entirely. So one thing that we need to keep in mind with the teachings of the New Testament, which is contained in the Gospels and in these letters, is that what Paul was teaching, what Jesus taught, the testimony that the, the, the gospel, the authors of the gospel, uh, what they heard of Jesus teaching, what they ultimately, those who went out and taught, Peter, James, John, you know, many others, Paul, Timothy, these folks were not teaching what we're reading. This was their, this was their teaching of the Old Testament and the message of Jesus Christ. It was this fulfillment that was being uh, taught. And so, you know, the idea that... Um, Again, I, what I was tying this back to was the word missionary and missions, which is primarily an evangelical term. And it means go and preach that Jesus died, that he rose again, and that you can be saved from your sins so you don't have to be condemned to hell, and that when you die, you get to go to heaven. So you want to go make conver converts, those who will accept this salvation message, and then give them the security that their eternity is now set. And they will live in heaven and not hell for eternity. But that's not the message of the gospel. It was not the quote unquote good news. And the more that I've looked at the, the way the interactions that happen, not only with the religious people of the day, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, those of the, 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 uh, uh, who were the leaders in Judaism, and the response of the Roman Empire or the governing empires that we have seen since the Roman Empire, the, I, I don't see anything that is, I don't think that anyone was rejecting the idea that someone could be 
saved from their sins, and, and have a good afterlife, okay? That's not what caused such a stir. What caused such a stir is that the message they were preaching was about living a whole new way of life while you're still here on earth. That the governance of your life would be ordered by, led by, a whole new way. Uh, and it would produce a different culture. Now the governing, the, both both the, uh, the, the Judaizers, those who were the Jewish leaders, they were trying to maintain a particular culture with and particularly by the traditions that they carried. Okay? And the Roman Empire was also trying to instill a particular culture onto or into the world. They did that through various methods and means, through military conquest, a lot of destruction. But then once that first bloody portion was over, then they came in and they brought in the Greek philosophy and this new way of thinking, okay? That was the whole idea of the, the, the Pax Romana, okay, which was the peace of Rome. The peace of Rome came through the shed blood of countless lives. But what they, in their thinking, philosophically, was we have to do it this way because man is so resistant that we have to just smash it down with a hammer and it doesn't matter how many people die because whoever is left, we will be able to instill this culture and this order of life into their midst in each, and in each area and city and country that we are able to control and we can control that aspect of their life. And it, you know, one or two generations in, it will become the normal way of life and everyone will accept it, okay? So when you had, this is where the major disruption come. So we, you know, we've seen some of the recent, you know, uh, media productions like The Chosen and things like that. And you see these little, um, um, these nuances to the way that the, the Romans controlled, you know, what was one of the major things that happens. And we see this in Paul's letters in particular. And then we, you know, we see it portrayed in other ways through these, through these, you know, more recent medias. But one of the big problems that Rome was having was with uprisings of people. They didn't want people drawing a crowd and and having different ways of thought. The crowd itself wasn't the issue so much as that a constituency of people were being led by some other teaching or authority or way of thinking than what was coming from the leaders of Rome. That was trouble. So they had seen that in the past. They had seen, you know, the, those who um, had studied the, the former empires, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the, the, the Empire of Greece, and they saw how they ruled and controlled the people and the impacts that it had on the people. All of that was in consideration. And their, in their mind, they had come up with this ultimate solution that they were going to implement this beautiful philosophy of life. But the institution of it would have to come through military advancement. But ultimately, that would cause peace all over the world, even though they had to have major battles and wars and bloodshed to attain it. But that was beside the point. The point was that they finally got humanity to a place of, you know, what they perceived to be unity. Okay? So I want you to see this flip-flop that happens early on in Christianity with this same mindset of how those who ruled imagined that they would rule the world. And, and this is important because it hasn't changed one bit. The same methodology. 
The only thing that has changed today is the uh, is the the subtle nature of how the blood is shed in order to maintain control. So we have organizations today that are in place that are supposed to help the nations unite. I'm not going to directly mention the names, but those same kinds of ideas are being wrought out even still today. And we we will find that today it is still applicable that when there are those who are yielded to and submitted to a different culture, it's not simply because it's outside the norm. It's be, be, it's because those who want to be in control are unable to control it. And that's what caused this disrupt, disruption. So Paul's journeys, they weren't quote unquote missionary trips. It would be like someone coming within it and it's exactly what it was. You have an empire that was ruling, it had law, it had its own administration, and it had its own people who were put in positions to keep the law of the land. And it would be like someone coming in to that land and saying, here's a whole nother law. Here's a whole nother order of life that you're supposed to follow. If someone came into my house and said, here's the new rules, I, as a father, would say, I don't think so. I'm the head of this household. I decide how this household is ordered and what the, what the culture of life is in this house. That's the same perspective that they had of Christianity and of people like Paul who were sent to do so. Now, let's go back to the other side which is from Paul's perspective and what he was doing with these journeys and what he's doing with these letters as an apostle, as one who was given an apostolic grace, one who came to lay the groundwork, the foundation, who became a, a, a dispenser of and a communicator of this law, this order, that's exactly what Jesus did too. But he said, this law of life, this order of life comes from above. And it starts from within. So when we, when we, if Paul makes this comparison, which is why I'm taking a little bit of time in the intro, about the wisdom of the world, not only in this letter, but also other letters, the base ways of man, how man understands the governance of life. How man understands how cultures are to be nurtured and how they are to be initiated. And he's saying that's not how God does it, but here is how God does it. And here's how to practice it. And here's how to let that way of life be nurtured and, and, and matured in you and among you. That was the nature of Paul's message, and it, is, it was what drove him to travel from place to place. He wasn't just saying, have your sins forgiven, go to heaven, see you later, try to, try to do good things and not bad things. No, he was saying, because Christ did this, a new way of life has been opened up to mankind. And we can all participate, whoever will submit and believe, yes, through the death of Christ, because of the death and resurrection of Christ, because sin has been overcome and conquered, by faith you can enter into this new way of life and begin to live it and practice it and watch it produce something in you. And watch it bear fruit in you. So I want us to, this is bear, bearing fruit is mentioned a few times in here as well. Let's be clear. Bearing fruit is not equated to converting people to Christianity. That is not bearing fruit. But it is the way that the evangelicals have many times tried to convey what that is. Now, they would still say, yes, there are the fruits of the Spirit, so you should do those things. But see, that's still backwards. You don't 
practice the fruits of the Spirit. Love, patience, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness. Well, I need to be more gentle. I need to be kind. I need to be more patient. No, that's not what happens. What you need to do and the order of life that is from within is that when you are fully yielded to God, to the Spirit of God and led by him, then this fruit will be born. What's the difference? Well, one is by your own efforts. The other is by your yielding to another way of life. And that's, that's the key issue here. This is the key, uh, uh, both the, the Roman Empire at, the, at this time and the Jewish leaders at that time, that was the key disagreement. What are you yielding to? If you're not yielding to the law of Moses in the way that we understand it, then you're disrupting life and everything you do is wrong. And from the Roman perspective, if you are not yielding to Caesar as the only one who has the right in all this empire to tell people how to live, then you are out of place and you'll be punished for it. That's why Paul was imprisoned. That's why the Jewish leaders turned him in. They didn't want, they didn't like the Roman occupation. They didn't want to be ruled by Rome. But it was easy for them to simply turn a Christian in because of their commitment to a way of life to the Roman Empire because not only did it disagree with their religious ideals and teaching and traditions, it also was a, a, an affront to the Roman Empire. And they did that many times. So let's understand why Paul is in chains and what his message was. Colossians is not as... Uh, it's not laid out in the same way as Ephesians, but there are some similarities in the way that it is broken up in that Paul still relays portions of God's eternal plan. He does this in Colossians more specifically through uh, the, 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 the supreme nature of the anointed one, the Christ, who was Jesus. But then what he does is he ties the believer in as the body of Christ saying, this is still God's intention. So there's some correlation there to what the message in Ephesians was as well. And then in addition, in the latter part of this writing, he goes on to give some of that, this, these practical, relational applications to how to live this life. And through living this life in this way, individually and interpersonally, then this culture of God's kingdom will be produced in your midst. Okay? And so, uh, similarly, we can see the encouragement of Paul towards the, their very end of the letter. He encourages them to pass this letter on to the church at Laodicea and Hierop uh, uh, what was it called? Yeah, Hierapolis, which were nearby cities. Uh, Laodicea, we know uh, that the, the, the message of this, this good news of the kingdom of God came to them. Uh, they were one of, the, one of the seven churches mentioned in Revelation, whom uh, the Spirit of Christ was not happy with at all because of their lukewarmness. That's the church of Laodicea that was mentioned uh, in Revelation. So all to say... Um, Paul, I don't know that Paul even visited Colossae directly. Uh, the letter itself says that the message of the good news was brought to uh, the Colossians by a man named Epaphras, whom we don't know a whole lot about. Um, it is possible, we know that Epaphras was ultimately imprisoned for being a messenger of the good news. He may or may not have been imprisoned with Paul at some point in Rome. Um, and there's also a possibility that Epaphras 
may have come to the gospel himself, come to Christ and this new life and way of life himself and been uh, uh, growing and maturing as a believer under Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Ephesus was about 100 miles away from Colossae. And then um, uh, Laodicea and Hierapolis were much nearer to Colossae. So that's kind of some uh, an, an introductory background to this particular letter, but also to several of other of Paul's letters. Obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the idea behind what Paul's mission was um, would be the same for every letter he wrote because it didn't change. He was commissioned by God to do something uh, in particular. So in chapter 1, Paul, um, you know, he's – if you think about, let's just kind of paint the picture in our mind that he's had some communication with Epaphras. Epaphras uh, has has not only brought the message of the good news, but been working to, um, you know, build up the believers in Colossae. And he has come to Paul. Obviously, he knew Paul prior to that or heard of him and then came to convey to Paul the condition uh, of the church uh, in Colossae, and so Paul deemed it necessary and worthy of writing a letter to them for encouragement and for uh, the uh, to convey uh, teaching and truth to them, uh, so that they may be built up. And um, so he talks about that initially in chapter one. Um, how encouraged he is. Um, we know that uh, this is not just related to, again, the sharing of a particular gospel message of salvation. He says in verse 5, the faith and love that spring from hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth the gospel that has come to you. The gospel, God, the word gospel we know means good news. So what again is this good news that has come to them? Well, it's the good news of the kingdom of God and the message of a new way of life and a new governance of life according to God's will. And it is also the teaching of what God's will is. Now that is directly connected to the line of, of uh, similarity that we've been trying to draw through all the scriptures, which is, okay, what is God's eternal purpose? And we are at a point in history here with uh, Paul's uh, time of life where a lot of revelation came after the resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Christ. Then Paul had the experience with Jesus on the road to Damascus. We also know that uh, Paul also had some other very direct experiences with, with the Lord uh, in way of revelation, the revealing of the law of Moses, the, re the revealing of the purpose, the eternal purpose of God in all that he had done. And so um, that, I, I know I'm expanding this out a little bit, but that's all what is contained in the word that we would use, the gospel, which means the good news. So the good news was not just some short, sweet message that you could either accept or not and then go your way. It, it was something that required engagement. It would be uh, similar to coming in and saying, here is what this new kingdom and its order and its rule entails. Do you want to learn more about that? Do you want to be a citizen of this kingdom? Do you want to yield to this order of life? And so the believers were those who said, yes, we want to, we want to yield to this order of life, which comes via the Holy Spirit and is from above. And so Paul is expressing his encouragement. He goes on to say, after verse 5, verse 6 now, uh, the gospel that has come to you. And then it says, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it uh, under God's grace and all its truth. Okay, 
So here we see that mentioning of the bearing of fruit. Now, many would try and interpret this to say that uh, uh, Paul's saying that more, more and more people are becoming believers. But that's not what he's saying. Now, were there, be, were there believers being added to their number? Yes, we know that that was the case. But what was bearing fruit was the nature of this life began to have its impact and, and to take root in the midst of the believers. So he's saying this way of life is being practiced, put into practice, and it is bearing its fruit. In other words, the culture is developing. And we can see it by the testimony of what's going on among you, the relationships among you, the way that you're being governed spiritually, and your reception of the truth, the word of truth. So that's exactly what he expresses here. So, you know, I'm going to touch on certain scriptures in this, in this letter, but what I really want us to see is what Paul is directly touching on and what it means. Otherwise, we can read through all of Paul's epistles and just think that he was just a missionary and he just preached for people to be able to go to heaven when they die and that it was successful to a certain extent and that it, it helped people out. But we would never see Paul as an apostle and we would never have any reception of or understanding of what, uh, ap the, the, what apostolic grace is. And how he was an administrator of this way of life. So our focus is not simply on Paul, quote unquote, as an apostle. But without recognizing the nature of his work, then we can miss the kingdom altogether. Because again, we may look at it sim simply as, well, Paul was a great missionary. And not as Paul came to lay the foundations for a new way of life, a kingdom order of life. Okay? So he continues with this line of thinking, verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Okay, again, Paul is not, the message that he's writing about here is not, we want you to better understand that you're not going to hell anymore and that you'll be saved from heaven. I just really want to drive that in, not, not just for you, but for our listeners, that this is not a quote-unquote evangelical message. It is a kingdom message that is fully wrapped with the purpose of God. He wants every believer to have a full, mature understanding of what God's eternal purpose is and how God's wisdom is applied to each believer's life and in their relationships and in the way they make decisions and how they interact with the world and in how they obey the leading of the Spirit. And then what fruit that produces in their midst as a people. So th hear that in what he's saying. He continues verse 10. We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. So Jesus is pleased in something beyond our salvation. He wants us to live a life worthy. That means that there's a discipline of life that has to be practiced and put into place. And what does it look like? Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance, patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of life. You see, this is a whole order of life. It's not a singular decision. It's not holding up a creed. 
It's something that has to grow up within you. So he makes this contrast in verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion. Okay, let's think about the word. Let's read it, but then I'll go back. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So is the forgiveness of sins included in all this? Obviously, yes. But what are the two key words used here in this verse? Dominion and kingdom. So as I was saying earlier, what's the real problem with, the mess- with this message of good news? Well, what does dominion mean? It's power, rule, authority over, control over. So you were being ruled by darkness, but and you were saved from that, but now you're brought into a kingdom. Okay, let me ask you this. Is a kingdom without law and order? Does a kingdom have a king? Does a king appoint certain trusted, proven individuals and peoples to set forth and communicate and maintain that order that comes from the throne and the decisions that are made from the throne? So is this not also a rule, an authority, a dominion? It is. And that's the primary issue. What order is ruling your life? What is the active, what has active dominion in you, in your life? So he makes this contrast of these two ruling orders, the world and the kingdom of God. And when Paul refers to the world, he's not just referring to those who are, uh, you know, uh, 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 ignorant of God as if they're pagans and have nothing to do with God. He also includes the religious people who are trying to put all their own laws and traditions forcibly onto the people. He goes into that in chapter two. But the next thing he does after talking about the contrast of dominion here is he comes to lay the foundation for the ultimate supreme rule of Christ. And he starts that in verse 15 by saying, He, Christ, the Son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So he's going to give Christ preeminence in all things, He is also touching on one of the very first things that God ever said about man, which is, let us create create him in our image and in our likeness. Now he's saying this full plan of God was fulfilled in Christ Jesus first. But that commission was also given to Adam. The first man, which is why we can see Jesus Christ was called the last Adam. He fulfilled God's purpose for man. Now, that doesn't mean it's an end because God did not only create Adam or only create Christ. There are countless other lives through humanity. And he wanted there to be a pattern of life through which and by which the invisible God would be made known to all creation. And that pattern life was not to be individually expressed, but expressed through a people. That was always God's purpose. We can see that clearly laid out when God covenant made his covenant with Abraham. And then through what he did with Israel when he uh, redeemed them out of Egypt. So Paul's touching on the, the depth of what God's plan has always been through the ages, not only up until this point when he wrote the letter to the Colossians, but also unto today, to this very day. 
So he, there's a lot that you can take in terms of, you know, you know, doctrinal truth in relation to the supremacy of Christ. Um, I'm not going to get into those, those details in this study. That would be uh, set apart for, you know, maybe a more detailed study of this book. But for the purposes of our, of our survey through the scriptures, I, I want to highlight a few things within this, but not to, to, to undermine whatsoever uh, those, those, uh, those truths that are contained about the preeminence of Christ here. But I do want to tie that in uh, with a couple of things. You know, uh, further down he in 18 he says, because he gives Christ all the preeminence here, and he gives him the supreme authority over all. Verse 18 he says, he is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Okay? He is the beginning so that in everything he might have supremacy. So indicated here is that he's not the only. He was the first, but he's not the only. And the onlys, the, the, excuse me, the not onlys, in other words, there are others who are to be included. Okay, Hebrews says that he was the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, so we're talking about a family, a community in which this culture can be practice, nurtured, and then bear fruit, okay? So he says, verse 19, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell him, dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Then he goes on to say, and you were once alienated from God. So this is, again, that, that being in the dominion of darkness, okay, because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. So something is, has changed in, in the heavenly realms. You know, Satan... <laughs> Uh, the enemy is not unaware of God's plans. But in order to be released from his dominion and while under his dominion, also finding your place in the position of accusation before God's throne, we must have the redemption that comes through Christ, which was through his physical death, his shedding of blood, his resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father. So please do not hear me say anywhere along here that that truth and that message and that work of Jesus Christ is to no effect. It is the absolute crux, the hinge on which the door is opened. It is impossible without it. And for that reason, Christ was made our high priest. And for that reason, his name will be set above every other name and his throne above every other throne. Do not hear me say anything other, otherwise than that. What I want us to see is that what Paul's going to continue to, to, to lay out here is that through the church, because it is the body and Christ is the head, we are also to be included in the fullness that was given to Christ, the fullness of this pattern life what God had ordained from ages past, okay, long time before. And that's, again, that's part of what Paul is touching on here when he's talking about the fulfillment of the life of Christ, who was the image, he says in Hebrews, the exact representation of the Father. See, that's that was a struggle for the Jews at the time too because... God is spirit, so how can he be expressed in an image? Through, uh, through, how can he have an image in man? But they missed God's whole express purpose. Yes, God is spirit. No, God will not be confined to uh, you know, uh, uh, an image in, in that way of description as if he was an idol 
or even one particular man. The image of God is expressed in man through a way of life and a governance of life and order of life. That is how God is seen. And that was what Jesus said to the disciples when they said, reveal the Father to us. He says, don't you know, or at, up to this point, do you still not know that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father? This is what it looks like for that life and its ways and its governance to find a fleshly fulfillment. God in the flesh. That's the fulfillment and the embodiment of what is spirit being fleshed out. Jesus was that, but he wasn't to be the only one. He was the first. And it was a whole different kind of life, a whole different source of life, and a whole different way, order, and governance of life. And God has always intended, that was his first expressed purpose for man, that they be created in his image and in his likeness, destined to manifest to make seen, to make known, to cause to appear. Oh, that's what the life of God looks like in every situation, in every circumstance, in every relationship, in every decision that is made. That's what the pattern life of Christ was all about. So he says, Verse 22 of chapter 1, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you as holy in his sight without blemish and free of accusation. So in other words, you too become a lamb presented before God because of Christ. If you continued, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. That is, that yes, through the sacrifice of Christ, we are able then to not only be redeemed or liberated from the dominion of darkness, but become sons, citizens of this new kingdom and be perfected by God into the place of fullness and maturity, even to the full stature of Christ, as he says in Ephesians. That's the hope held in the gospel. He says it later, Christ in you. And the same, we'll get to that in just a second. This is the gospel. This is the message that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. He says, that is the service that I give my life to. That's the purpose for which I live. We talked about that. Uh, in Philippians a little bit, when he said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's what he's saying. I have no other reason to live. And I've been commissioned to be an administrator of this life, this way of life, and this order of life. So he continues, I rejoice in what I suffered for you, as I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of, a, of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission, so here we go again with Paul's apostolic commission that God gave me, to present to you the word of God in its fullness. That's a, a, a key here. Paul's commission and appointment from God and his commitment to the ministry of the word of God, okay, was, was, again, we're not just talking about a printed version of Scripture here as the Word of God, but what God's expressed intentions were, purposes were, from the very beginning. In its fullness, he says. In another letter, he will say, We have seen in part, but as this life matures in us, then we will see in full. We will be made perfect. Become mature. Have a fullness of knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And he says, that's what I'm presenting to you. And another scripture, 1 Corinthians, you know, he talks about 
this continuation of this message that he gives to the mature. Those who, as he says in Hebrews, may go on into maturity and receive a greater revelation of God's purpose and how the life of God is to be manifest in and through his people. So he touches on that to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that was kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saint. So in Ephesians, he touched on this mystery as well in another portion saying, well, it wasn't just the Jews. The Jews were to be this pattern people, this peculiar people, so that God could be made known to all people. That's the mystery is that this is not just for one particular group of people. It is a way of life that God wanted to make known to mankind as a whole. If they're willing to submit to it, if they're willing to yield to its order and way of life. And that was hidden for ages. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this ministry, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is the hope of glory? Christ in you, okay. That is the fullness of the life of God and the expression of the image of God in you. So Hebrews 2.10 says, and we've referred to this a couple of times already, but let's just jump over there real quick. Hebrews 2.10 says this. Well, just before it says, because Christ suffered death so that by the grace of God he may taste death for everyone, verse 10, in bringing many sons to glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now, suffering was not just Jesus' death on the cross. It was that he fully allowed, suffering means to allow, to give permission, to yield to. He allowed God to have his way as the ruling, guiding life rather than his own way. And we saw that all the way up to the point of Jesus' death. Father, not my will, but your will. I will suffer your will to be done. I will allow myself to be given over to your will. That's how the life of God was fully expressed in Jesus Christ. Because the will of God was fully accomplished in him. He always yielded to it. And thereby he became the expressed image of God in all that he did. Now Paul is here saying, this is our hope. That you will yield to this life in the same way so that the fullness of Christ can be developed and matured and perfected in you. That's the message and the mystery that he was proclaiming. So he continues verse 28. We proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Guys, again, this is not just, quote unquote, I'm, Paul's not preaching the gospel again and again. He's not telling people who have already come to Christ through salvation in Christ because of his death to keep on you know, believing that again and again just to share that message. No, he's saying there's a way of life that has to be lived. And he's admonishing, teaching in this way. Why? So that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Now this is touching on a whole love, another level of Paul's ministry as a priest of the Most High God through the ministry of the Word to make pure these living sacrifices, these lives that will be presented to God. This is the way he's, this is the kind of language that he's using. So that we, that he would as a priest of the Most High God be able to take 
the lives of these believers having been purified and washed and cleansed and made because of the life and blood of the shed blood of Jesus Christ to be made without spot and blemish. And so their lives can be built up in the perfection of God's ways and yielded to him and then thereby become presented to God as perfect in Christ. So that we may present everyone perfect, mature, complete, full in Christ. Why? That will be well-pleasing to God. That is exactly what God wanted to see. That's the fruit that he wanted to see born from this way of life. And that's why he says, that's what I'm laboring for. To this end, I labor. Struggling with all his energy, with all that the Spirit has to give me, with every gift and every blessing that I receive from above, I am putting it into this labor. That the saints of God may be perfected in his way of life. That is what's so powerfully working within me. And that, again, is why he is writing this message. He goes on in chapter 2, which we'll, we'll kind of tie up today here. But again, he, just because this is the same line of thought, he says, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea. And for all who have not met me personally, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, he's struggling that this, the wisdom, the application, the practice of, and thereby the bearing fruit from this way of life. That's what he's working for. He's like a laborer in God's field, caring and nurturing each one of those plants so they can produce the fruit that God wants to see. That's the harvest he wants. That's what he wants to gather in. And he will continue from here into chapter 2 to say, don't let anyone else deceive you into thinking that God wants to do it in any other way. This isn't a new religion. This isn't a new sect of Judaism. I want you to be opened up to the fact that this is a whole new way of life, but it's what God always wanted to see produced in his people. And he goes on to say continually, this isn't like the governments of the world either. You can't think of it in that way. So he will continue We'll continue there next week to look because he is going to go into some details and then he'll finish uh, with the details of how, again, similar to what he did in Ephesians, how that was met out in uh, regular relationships of life between husbands and wives, children and parents, slaves and masters, and others. And then he will finish up with some final encouragements. So we will tie up for there. Uh, there today, I know I got a little passionate about things. I'm almost out of breath, but uh, you know, I'm I'm just really encouraged by Paul's uh, fervor, not just with him as an individual. My excitement comes from the legitimacy and the power of this message and the portrayal of this way of life, which we ourselves are are striving not only to enter into but to be perfected in. And so receive this encouragement as from uh, Paul here uh, to, to really give yourself into this way of life. So we'll finish up there for today.